All right, uh, let us begin. Uh, we still have some folks coming in from the waiting room, but I think we'll get started um, to ensure we have enough time for, for this important conversation today. Uh, welcome back to ProCon. Uh, nice to see uh, so many of you again. Um, as a reminder, this is the uh, CEO, Executive Director of Peer Community Session. If you were looking for something else, uh, you can find the link back on the conference platform. Um, and uh, I, think, I think I've introduced myself to most folks uh, on the screen I see so far, but in case I haven't, I'm Gabe Mose, Chief Experience Officer at JCC Association. And staffing this call today with me is Leah Garber, uh, who is in Israel. She's the VP for Israel Engagement and Director of the JCC Association Center for Israel Engagement. Um, feel free to chat to either of us uh, if you need assistance or have a question uh, sort of on the technical side uh, or content side. Um, and uh, speaking of, of, uh, of that, a couple of words of housekeeping before we move on to the session itself. Um, as usual, we're recording. Uh, we'd love for you to keep your camera on um, uh, if you're able. Nice to see everybody. It's nice for the speakers to see who's here. Um, uh, so we'll appreciate that if you can do it. Um, and since we don't all know each other, if you welcome to change your uh, name so it includes your JCC name, that'll help everybody out as well. Um, I think as yesterday and some of the other sessions, we've turned on the closed captioning and uh, you can figure out how to turn that off or move it if you'd like, please feel free. Um, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, we're so happy that uh, this, this uh, enormous conference is being provided uh, without cost to JCCs and their staff members. And that is only possible due to the generous uh, uh, sponsorship uh, of some 36 sponsors this year, including for these two CEO sessions, um, uh, collaborative Strategies and Acrosoft uh, Corporation. Um, uh, as many of you know, for some 15 years, uh, CSI has been helping JCCs balance uh, the mission of fulfilling financial responsibility, uh, excuse me, balance mission fulfillment and financial responsibility uh, by providing strategic and business planning services. But even beyond JCCs, and I'm not sure how much folks know about this, CSI actually provides uh, guidance to uh, federations, Hillel, synagogues, day schools, and related organizations. So that gives them actually a more broad understanding of the Jewish community and the evolution in the Jewish community, which of course is relevant. And we certainly encourage you, if you haven't, to tap into their expertise uh, during ProCon or otherwise. Uh, and Acrosoft, um, uh, historically, they began with a desire actually to help JCCs overcome technology limitations. And that purpose uh, still rings true today. Uh, their solutions are powered by a cloud platform and include websites and apps and features specifically designed for JCCs, uh, such as program management, member reservations, major events, check-in, and they'll, of course, be in the virtual vendor hall today as well. Uh, we hope you take a visit. Uh, and with that introduction, now on to our session for today. Um, in thinking about these two uh, uh, CEO peer communities, um, we thought about... Uh, pulling back or stepping aside, uh, uh, if you will, from some of the more narrowly fo focused exec calls that we've had through the course of the pandemic uh, and digging into some of the more broad uh, challenges uh, and opportunities faced by JCCs and particularly you as uh, senior leaders. Um, as important as those specific issues were that we tackled and we're gonna continue to tackle those through calls and gatherings, um, we wanted to take a broad look and uh, specifically today to talk about leadership, uh, leadership in times of crisis and how each of us thinks about um, the ways in which we shape the future of our organizations. Um, in, in thinking about that concept, um, uh, or at least beginning that conversation, certainly 90 minutes is, is not enough to, uh, to have all the conversation we want. Um, many of, of my colleagues at JCC Association and beyond immediately suggested that we invite Marty Linsky to uh, teach uh, and guide us in conversation, and we're so thrilled that uh, he agreed. Um, uh, uh, and of course, you may have heard the shout outs uh, from Daron and Golly Cooks in Movement Moment, Moment, Moment yesterday, so another affirmation uh, uh, that hopefully we made, not hopefully, but we made a good choice. Uh, for those who don't know, Marty recently retired uh, after nearly 40 years teaching about leadership, politics, and media at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, he authored uh, or co-authored uh, over, uh, co over a dozen books, 
and chapters, including with Ron Heifetz, the best-selling leadership on the line, uh, and uh, with Ron and Alexander Grashko, the practice of adaptive leadership. Uh, he's a graduate of Williams College and Harvard Law School, uh, and has been an uh, assistant minority leader of the Massachusetts House of Representatives, reporter and editorial writer uh, for the Boston Globe, and chief secretary and counselor uh, to the Massachusetts governor. Marty lives in New York. I gather a couple blocks from where I am. Uh, he roots for the Red Sox, which I don't have to tell you because he's, uh, he's proudly showing that off. He's run nine marathons, uh, serves on the board of several nonprofits, including Leading Edge. Uh, and he's made, you may have read in his online bio, he enjoys uh, strong gin and vegetarian food. So that's something to look forward to mm -hmm. when we can gather in person. Uh, joining Marty as part of the program today are two members of this group. Uh, Michael Waldman, CEO of the Minneapolis, excuse me, <laughs> Minnesota JCC, and Brian Siegel, CEO of the JCC of Metropolitan Detroit, each of whom uh, began to lead evolutions or revolutions or transformations uh, uh, at their centers uh, prior to COVID and continued uh, during the pandemic and still to this day in those processes. Um, Michael has more than 20 years of professional experience uh, in the JCC movement. Uh, beginning as a camper at JCC Camp Butwin in Minnesota, uh, where he later worked as CIT counselor, music specialist, we might call on you for that, Michael, be careful what you include in your bio, right. uh, program director, and ultimately camp director. Uh, he was the vice president and CEO at the bar shop JCC in San Antonio uh, for five years prior to coming back to Minnesota in 2010 uh, and assuming the role of CEO at the St. Paul JCC. Uh, and as you'll hear in a bit, uh, when St. Paul and uh, uh, Minneapolis merged in 2021, he became the CEO of the shared entity, and we'll hear a bit more about that soon. Um, Brian uh, is an attorney by training who spent uh, time as a real estate attorney in Chicago before moving uh, home to Detroit to uh, open Joe Dumar's Fieldhouse, an athletic and entertainment facility. Uh, with former Detroit Pistons star Joe Dumars, as well as a, an event center, several restaurants, and Detroit Axe, which I understand is the first wholly dedicated axe throwing venue in the state of Michigan. So another something to do once we can uh, travel around freely after the pandemic. Um, Brian is a longtime entrepreneur, uh, was heavily involved as a volunteer in the Detroit Jewish community, among other philanthropic endeavors, and he served twice as the lay president of the Detroit uh, JCC board, uh, the second time uh, leading the JCC out of some financial uh, crises, at which point he assumed leadership four years ago as CEO. Um, just in a moment, I'll turn things over to Marty uh, to, to uh, kick us off. Um, after that, we'll hear just format wise, we'll hear briefly from Michael about uh, sort of the basic facts of what happened uh, with the Minnesota JCCs. Um, then Marty will be in dialogue with Michael about uh, his leadership through those processes. Uh, we'll then hear from Brian a bit about the, uh, uh, the facts as it were uh, of Detroit and the transformation there. Uh, and then Marty will be in dialogue with him after which we'll spend some time in breakout groups reacting to those conversations uh, and what we've heard and also sharing a bit about our own uh, challenges and opportunities. Um, and then finally, we'll come back together as a full group uh, for Q&A and discussion. So that's our format for today. Uh, with that, I extend deep thanks to Marty, uh, Brian, and Michael for being with us. And I'll turn things over to you, Marty. You, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gabe. And um, hello uh, to the JCC execs who have joined us. Uh, uh, it, it must be have been an unbelievable journey for, for you for the last 15 or 16 months. And I have enormous respect for uh, the, the roles that you play in the Jewish communal world in the best of times and in, particularly in the complicated times that we've been through. Um, we have outrageous aspirations for the brief time that we have together. Um, our hope is that uh, in this, this brief interlude that we will be able to enhance your own leadership effectiveness. Uh, so in order to do that, we're going to do three things. Uh, one is I'm going to ask you right now to take 30 seconds uh, to write uh, or on your type on your iPad or your computer uh, a, a, you, what you think of as 
what is keeping you awake, awake at night? What is your current leadership challenge? Another way to think about that more broadly is uh, uh, what, what is the gap between your aspirations for your JCC, for your organization, for your team, maybe even for your community and the current reality? Um, and trying to think about uh, how we can uh, close that gap. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you to take 30 seconds to do that. Um, the second thing we're going to do is uh, use uh, Michael and Brian. Um, their cases are very specific to the Twin Cities and to Detroit, um, but we're hoping that they're the, what they experience, what they've learned, will have produced some um, more generalized lessons that will be useful for you, whatever the nature of your particular situation is um, in your community. Um, and then after they uh, go over the facts, um, we'll have a conversation. I'll have a conversation with each of them. And, and then we're going to put you into breakout groups. We'll talk about that a little more where everybody on this call will have a chance to have a consultation on their case. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'm going to, uh, I'd like to do one piece of um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, framing of some language that we're going to use. Um, uh, in my experience and observation, the uh, biggest cause of failure in trying to exercise leadership uh, is trying to address what I think of as adaptive challenges as if they were technical problems. Now, what's the difference between technical problems and adaptive challenges? Um, my favorite example of this is, uh, has always been my mother's uh, driving. Uh, my mother, who died at age 102 uh, five years ago, um, she was driving well into her 90s. Uh, and my brother and I began to notice uh, some small scrapes on her car, and we began to talk to her about her driving. Uh, my mother was a very smart woman. Uh, uh, was a voracious reader, uh, went to theater, went to opera, um, played bridge. In fact, the week before she died, she played bridge three times. Um, uh, but she was driving and we began to talk to her about her driving. Now, my mother knows how, knew how to stop driving you. It's very simple. It's a simple technical problem. You take the key out of the ignition and you uh, put it in a drawer somewhere. That's how you stop driving. But of course, the problem, uh, some of you may have elderly parents who are dealing with this issue right now. Uh, the problem is that my mother's resistance to stopping driving didn't have anything to do with how you stop driving. Um, it had to do with her identity. You know, she got up in the morning, she looked in the mirror and she saw a 93 year old woman who still drove at night. She was the only person she knew in that category um, and it was if that was part of her name, uh, Ruth Linsky, who still drives at night, you know, one word. Um, at one point in our conversations, our very intense conversations sometimes about her driving, she looked at me and she said, you know, if I stop driving, I will feel diminished and I will be diminished. Um, adaptive problems live between your neck and your navel technical problems live above your neck. And it is easy to try to think about a problem that you are facing as a technical problem because then it, it's fixable. You can hire an expert, you can hire Deloitte, you can hire McKenzie, you can hire consultants to come in and tell you right the answer. You can find a best practice somewhere. Uh, the challenge around problems which lie in people's stomachs and hearts and their identities and their values, their belief systems, is that when you start moving that stuff around, you're dealing with people's emotions, and what people care about, not what they think, but what they care about. If I send my son-in-law one more picture of a diseased lung, he's not going to stop smoking. He, he, he's, he's a very smart guy. Um, if you ask him if smoking causes cancer, he'd check yes on the box and then he'd go outside and have a smoke to calm down. So it's very tempting in any system, in any organization, in any team 
to try to understand problems as primarily technical problems. Uh, but the problems that need leadership, the problems that require an exercise of leadership are primarily adaptive in nature. And I hope in our conversations with Michael and Brian, we will begin to tease out some of the ways of dealing with issues that are primarily adaptive in nature. And as you think about what is keeping you awake at night, uh, I would encourage you to think about how you understand what that problem is and think about it in this framework of uh, to what extent is it a technical problem and to what extent is it an adaptive challenge. Um, we are on a very tight time frame here. And so um, it is time for me to turn this over. I would like before Gabe, before you pick this up, I'd like you to ask you to wait 30 seconds and allow people to write down on a piece of paper or type into their computer uh, what their current leadership challenge is so we come back to that in small groups. Thanks very much and I look forward to this time with all of you. Thanks, Marty. So with that, uh, we'll, we'll turn first to Michael. And uh, Michael, we'd love it if you would spend just a couple of minutes giving us the, uh, just the facts, ma'am. What, what, what evolution uh, uh, did, did the Minnesota JCCs go through? What are the basics uh, so that we are all on the same page understanding the sort of brief history? Um, and, then, and then we'll invite uh, Marty back in to chat with you about the experience for you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, it's a, it's a pleasure and honor to see everyone. Um, so just a, a, a quick, it's a, it's hard to boil this story down into into two minutes. It's 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 complicated for sure. But as I've talked to others in the field, maybe not as unique as as we once thought. So the Twin Cities, for people who don't know, is really one metropolitan area. It's all connected and all combined. I'm in St. Paul right now. I can drive for three minutes and be in Minneapolis. So it's not, we're not two separate cities. We're one large metropolitan area, but in terms of a Jewish community, um, not still not as big as, as many uh, communities on this call. Um, uh, and, and, and the Jewish communities divide about two thirds of the people who are Jewish live in Minneapolis and about one third live in St. Paul. So um, the, 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 the interesting thing about the Twin Cities is even though we're one metropolitan area with, with only about 30 to 40,000 Jews, maybe 50 in our last population study, um, we have two of everything. So we have a Minneapolis Federation and a St. Paul Federation. We have a Minneapolis JFS and a St. Paul JFS, JCC, senior living. Uh, and it's not just the Jewish community. There's two Red Cross, there's two United Way, there's two Girl Scouts, there's two of everything. And what they're, we're starting to realize as a community and, and everyone's kind of going through the same process the JCC has just gone through is that that's not efficient and it's not a good use of resources. And as and especially in, in kind of crisis times when resources become thin, you start to wonder, okay, what can we do to be more efficient and to work together? So our story actually starts back though, well before COVID, really back um, to when I first started and, and at the, Coincidentally, at the same time, the Minneapolis uh, JCC CEO had changed, and we we got together and started saying, "Well, what? Why don't we work together? What don't we do together?" And we we made a conscious decision that we wanted to start to um, collaborate more. And so we went down a long path, and I'll skip a lot of the the detail that got us to about 2018, where we really, in earnest, said there should be one JCC, and we want to move this path. And and it wasn't just me and and the other CEO, it was really the, the leadership uh, or a portion of the leadership that decided we, we wanted to explore this. So we, we formed a, a leadership group that explored the issue. And I think we'll get more into kind of that, that process uh, in the next section, but um, it, was a, it was a really interesting process where uh, what I'll share is that for the most part, members, almost 100% of members 
and probably most of the community, 100%, not 100, but close to that, really wanted this or either thought this was a great idea or didn't even think about it or care about it. But a very small group of people really were, were not interested and not excited about this concept. And, and for some good reasons, some emotional reasons, some historical reasons, um, and that was what the process became about, really picking apart what are the real challenges, what are the perceived challenges, what are the emotional challenges, and then without saying we have to do this, so let's create every argument for why this has to happen, really exploring it and, and understanding should it or should it not, and then pass that decision, okay, now we think it should, how? So that, that was the process we went through, and here we are, uh, just what seems like minutes later, but it is really years later, um, the Minnesota JCC. That's a high level description. I, it's hard for me to say that that quickly. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks back Michael. In Marty. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Michael. Um, uh, here we go. So let me ask you, so start by asking you to think aloud for us about what, what was preserving the status quo? That is, wh why was that important to people? Um, yeah, so what's wh why interesting- did they, Why did they want to keep driving? To use well, so here's thing. the interesting thing. While Minneapolis is a much larger city and community and more Jewish people and far more philanthropic dollars, St. Paul historically as a JCC was a, was a stronger organization with uh, a longer history of leadership, uh, you know, a, a, an executive director that was here for 30 years and then followed up by his assistant director, who we all know, uh, Dory Donnell, very well. Um, I mean, really great staff leadership and amazing lay leadership and a very strong financial position. So uh, a, a large endowment fund. Minneapolis had struggled for a whole bunch of reasons, some real, some perceived, some emotional, some financial. And the leadership of St. Paul viewed this combination as giving up all this history, this excellence, this financial uh, resources, that, that the fear would be that it would then move to the larger community where more Jewish people live, where more stuff happens in the Twin Cities. And, and why would we do that? Why would we ever give up this great history and this amazing organization to, to fund Minneapolis, which has historically struggled? And why, uh, what, what was Minneapolis, Minneapolis people afraid of giving up? What were their fears? Uh, the Minneapolis line of thinking was mostly, this is a good idea, but for the people who were concerned about it, it was um, St. Paul always wants to come in and split everything 50-50, but we put in far more resources and far more uh, people and far more philanthropic dollars. So why would we why would we split everything 50-50 when we're a much larger community? And how did you and Josh resolve the issue of who was going to be the alpha male? <laughs> well, um, the, the, the way it worked, the reason it, one of the big reasons it works is Joshua came in at a time when um, he was a volunteer and a, a lay leader and a very successful uh business of, of his own and really came in because he loved the J and wanted to help, but didn't see himself as a long time career nonprofit professional or a JCC professional. And once kind of he got his lay of the land of what was going on and, and what would really make this work, he um, said point blank to me, this isn't what I want to do. I want to make this happen. And then I'm going to step aside and go back to, to my other life. So I want to I want to make the point here that it's not about the coincidence, but it's about understanding what people's needs and priorities are, and that's true for both the St. Paul crowd and the Minneapolis crowd, and for Josh himself, because understanding that he was not committed to being a, the alpha male in the in the subsequent organization gave you an enormous opportunity. So, Michael, how did you start? I'll, I'll just also add to that. I think we both committed early on that, and, and I would say this, you know, it was a little bit more risky for me, but my thinking in that whole thing wasn't, this only works if I get to be in charge. We both said, look, if in the end we come together and the community feels like we need a different person or a different personality or a different leader to be in charge, then we would both be willing to step aside and let that new person come in. So I think that kind of confidence in knowing like I have a network of 
of JCCs and other nonprofits in the in the Twin Cities and JCCs in the country that I don't I wasn't so worried that if this came together and I was out of a job, I would be in big trouble. So we both kind of had that mentality. So how did you start? What was the first step? So we started actually really small and we started consciously saying, what are the what are the easy wins that we could have in this in this collaboration? Because it started in a place where really almost the, all the lay leadership thought we should not collaborate on anything. So the first thing we did and was why, um, why do you think why do you think that was, Michael? No trust. History of being perceived burned by the other community. One of the really interesting things we did in this process was a uh, organizational culture study. We had brought in an outside person and we interviewed staff and lay leadership and other community. And almost, almost to every issue, the same things were being said about the other side of the river. So people would say, they only want to do this because they want our money. And, and in St. Paul, what that meant is they only want our endowment funds. And in Minneapolis, it meant they only want our philanthropic money. They, they, they'll never cross the river for a program that's over here. And they're, they're both talking about each other. And the truth is that that wasn't true. And everyone always crosses the river all the time. So super interesting. But, but there's a was, was lot there a of different, historic was there a different, distrust. difference between lay and professional in their responses? Or did they parallel each other? Um, no, no. It, it was very, very different from the lay leadership side than the professional side. There was more That's... collaborative intention. I think less history, too, right? You didn't have a lot of 30 year professionals who remember in 1975, we tried to do this and, and they did this and so it didn't work. So you really had uh, professionals who were more eager for this than the lay leadership. So in thinking about looking at the landscape here, you've got at least these four separate constituencies, professionals in Minneapolis, professionals in St. Paul, professionals lay in Minneapolis, lay. And each of those constituencies have different priorities and different set of values, different identities, different right. things that they care about, That's right. which means that they had to be addressed in slightly different ways. Right. Uh, leading on adaptive challenges is retail work, not wholesale work. It's not one size fits all. Right. Um, and so how did you, what was the first thing you did that began to break down those barriers? So the first thing we did was um, we had always sent two teams to Maccabi. We had Team St. Paul, and we would bring 10 or 12 kids and, and all the staff that you need to bring. And then we would have uh, Team Minneapolis with, you know, 10, 20, whatever number of kids and all that same staff. And we we said there, there came a year, I think one of the teen directors had left or something like that. And we said, let's just send one Team Minnesota to the JCC Maccabi games. And you... You would think that would be a pretty easy no-brainer. The first challenge was convincing JCCA to let us do it. Uh, they, they were afraid we would put together the ringer basketball team, which if you know the community was not was not something to be worried about. But we got past that challenge and, and one team. And um, I remember meeting with Jordan, uh, who might be on this call about this. And he said, no, 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 don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll make this happen. We'll figure this out. And, and he did, and we did. And then... Um, uh, you would think that would have been pretty simple. And I'll tell you a, a little, if I can, a, a funny story about what happened. It was a great learning moment in this process for us. Uh, St. Paul kind of took the lead. And in those early days, we would pick one center would take the lead and the other would just provide support. And so St. Paul was taking the lead on Maccabi. And so one of the things that the lead organization did was get all the, the gear, you know, the jerseys and the, the shirts and all the stuff that you get, the swag for Maccabi. And so what we had said was, and I can't remember exactly why, but the first year we did it, it was sort of like right before we were about to leave. And we said, we already have all the gear and it all says Team St. Paul. So this year, the, the, the logo and all the stuff, all the stuff is going to say Team St. Paul, but next year will be Team Minnesota or whatever it was going to be. And, um, you know, that was probably in May or June. And then in August, it all came and there was, a, there was a really weird moment and hurt feelings on the Minneapolis side. I was like, I thought we were one team. I thought we were one community. How come this all says Team St. Paul? And, and there was a, a kind of an email back and forth and, and it, got, um, it got heated for a moment. And then we stopped and said, wait a second. We agreed, we agreed to this and everyone kind of remember that. And then we said, going forward, we're always gonna assume, we made a set of rules after that. 
Going forward, here are the assumptions when we collaborate. And one of those was always assume best intentions. You know, if, if a mistake gets made, um, and I think someone actually mentioned that yesterday in, in, the, in the session about best intentions. Anyway, um, we had a whole set of, of rules about collaboration and it really helped everything moving forward. So Maccabi was the first thing, cultural arts programming was the second thing, and then we started doing more. And one of the things about the Maccabi story that appeals to me is that you actually had another constituency, which were the kids and the people going to the games, uh, who weren't part of all this history, and yet they, uh, what they cared about was performance at the games. But what um, they cared about was being with as many kids as possible. Right. The, the interesting thing is you talked about the constituencies, there's the, there's the staff and there's the lay leaders, but then <laughs> the most important constituency is the membership. It's the people that we serve. They all love this idea. To a, right. We never heard from members and, and community people that this was a bad idea or we shouldn't do it. It was always about time. It's about time. We, we even had a whole fundraising uh, gala that the theme was it's about time. Okay, we've, we've got to move I, on to Brian. I'm I was going to say, can I be the bad guy timekeeper? Yeah, and yeah, we'll, go ahead. Sorry, I could talk about this for a long time, but move we'll on. come back. Brian, we're going to, you know, uh, through my fault of long introduction, I'm going to going to ask you to give us the two penny, uh, uh, the two penny uh, version of of the evolution revolution in Detroit, and then uh, we want to hear you engage with Marty, and then we'll be able to to break out in groups. So go ahead, Brian. Oh, fine, Gabe. Cut me short. <laughs> I've never spoken for anything in my life for five minutes. That's, that's, <laughs> it, it was, it was going to be a challenge. Um, our, our, actually, our origin story of our crisis is uh, not that compelling. The questions that you, that you gave me in the prompts about when did I really understand the depth of the issue, where the stakeholders were, and some of our major hurdles, I think, are much more interesting. And we can either delve into them now or wait for Marty to probe them. Go, go for it, Brian. Okay, so our story, our, and I would say our problem is often framed in Detroit as a real estate problem. I wouldn't say our real estate was the problem. It triggered a relevance issue, brand related issues. But let's just start with the real estate. One thing we're good at in Detroit, and I assume we're good at in other parts of the country, is building people and people's names. So we ended up with a 440,000 square foot footprint uh, for a JCC whose business model really didn't justify that amount of commitment. We were spread out and we found ourselves in what I would refer to as the aura of bankruptcy, uh, the death spiral of, de of short-term decision-making that was impacting our brand. Um, I remember two things when I started, because I was, I had the benefit of some perspective of having been the board chair on two occasions. So I certainly knew more than many people, but when you become the CEO and really look under the hood, it's a very different view. Maybe, you know, 20% before now you learn so much more, but when I became the CEO, I had two things that really opened my eyes as, as to the depth of our brand and relevance problem. One was in my first week, I went out on a PJ library trip to Colorado and there was a meeting uh, in Detroit, a very prominent donor family is the Davidson family. I was invited to their house with the PJ people and, it, and the representative Davidson, the, the first thing that she came to tell me was that I might not feel that welcome there. Now, I've known the Davidson family for a long time. But as a representative of the JCC, we were persona non grata. And there was frankly no future for the JCC if we didn't have a relationship, not only a working relationship, but a profound relationship with the Davidson Foundation. The second was I had a friend within the first couple of weeks who came to me, she was representing a donor who was the name donor on our child development center. And she said to me, Brian, I said, I just don't know why our community needs to have a health club. And my reaction, initial reaction to my friend was, well, Susie, we're really proud of our health club, but we're so much more than a health club. And then I reflected and I said, it almost doesn't matter what the truth is. The truth is she reflected a worldview 
about the relevance of our JCC in our town, that it was going to be relegated to the notion of being a health club. And those two moments really were profoundly impactful about the depth of the climb that we needed to make to reclaim our brand and relevance in Detroit. So uh, early on, I'm, I'm going along Gabe's uh, prompts. Um, I, we made a decision to hire an outside, a very reputable outside business consultant to work with me to establish the beginnings of a strategic plan with me and our board. And uh, when they hired me to do the job, the key, let's say call it the name on the building stakeholder. And when he came to me, because we've been working together on JCC for years, you know, I said to him, I said, Larry, you know, I am absolutely the wrong guy for this job if you're not prepared to have the stomach for uh, profound change and looking at this problem a different way because we've been circling the drain at the JCC in Detroit for 20 years. And if you're just looking for another person to keep us from actually going down the drain, as opposed to pointing us into a much more profitable future, please do not do me the favor of not asking me to do the job. So we hired this outside firm in conjunction with the board, we came up with an extraordinarily aggressive seven part strategic plan that evolved into eight and nine as any good strategic plan would. And it was almost, it was considered almost laughably aspirational in its nature. Um, but uh, we've kind of attacked that and kind of got, we got uh, major stakeholder buy-in by virtue of our process with this outside firm with great credibility, the buy-in of our board. And we embarked on a full sea change of the JCC in a transformational strategic plan um, and just started going after it with a full commitment of the board. Um, I'm just gonna look at one other question. Um, obviously this all happened before the pandemic. So the nature, and I know we're getting into my five minutes, is the nature of this uh, fundamental change is we agreed as a board to move from the real estate paradigm JCC into what we refer to as the programmatic uh, collaborative JCC. We see ourselves as a platform as opposed to a place and we modified our mission statement to take out all references to physical plant, that we are an engine for building community through programming. So it's essentially the how we build Jewish community that changed, not the what we do, we build Jewish community, but how we do it uh, through collaboration and programming as opposed to providing safe space. We made that case, we embarked on this strategic plan and um, we've been, just firing away at it now for uh, for five or six years. And then um, lastly, I think, and then the pandemic took a 20 year plan of transition from the real estate JCC to the programmatic date JCC. And then in a matter of a month, combine that to a two or three year plan where we said, this is the moment we take advantage of this crisis and transform. I say the, the challenge that we had, because in the questions was what was an unexpected challenge, was the stickiness of the brand reputation that had been developed over two decades about the nature, the mediocrity and the nature of the JCC and people's emotional commitment to that narrative and undoing that. That's the nature of brand, both positive and negative. It tends to stick. So radical reinvention was a, a prerequisite to taking ourselves out of the brand graveyard in Detroit. Brian, what was the hardest moment for you in this process? Well, the moments that I mentioned to you where I re re really fundamentally realized the depth of the challenge, uh, the despair that we felt in that room in Davidson, um, and really, because I've been a volunteer in Federation for years, but to all of a sudden flip to the CEO and feel this kind of personal, I wouldn't call it animus, but uh, how I would call it disregard uh, for the relevance of the institution was incredibly sobering. Um, I think it inspired us, but was really an extraordinarily hard moment. 
Did you get any personal pushback that was difficult for you, relationships that were um, put at risk? Very much so. So it's interesting. So I, had, I was fortunate in that I had a lot of uh, trusting relationships in the community as a longstanding volunteer in the community. But I would say it has taken, um, I would say the thoughtful application of those relationships along the way to bring the community along to our radical reinvention. Sometimes at a cost to those relationships, I think not long-term, but sometimes there was very challenging to take those personal relationships and, and really bring people along to some hard decisions, particularly closing the health club where we had 1300 active members who it was heartbreaking or closing of our Oak Park JCC. These were really heartbreaking decisions. So I think it was a testament on some level to our ability to lead through that and, and, and apply our relationships to, to be given the chance to operate post those heartbreaking situations. Did the, the health club aficionados organize themselves to push back or was it more random? Well, well, how, how does, did that... So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very clear that we had the benefit, and it sounds strange to say, the benefit of the pandemic in this weird little way was that uh, when, when that happened and we decided to accelerate the pace of change from 20, 10 to 20 years to three years, the health club was already closed. So people had already started the process of mourning their ritual uh, and the community basis upon which they use the health club. Our strategic decision in that moment was to not try and convince anybody that there, this wasn't a real loss but to lean into that and share with them authentically and, and empathically the nature of that loss. But we did have the benefit of the pandemic already um, uh, broaching that subject significantly with them. Before uh, we transition to the small groups, I wanna make a couple of points. Uh, there are a couple of points of commonality in these stories um, as you're thinking about your own situation and your own JCCs. One is that, uh, neither Brian or, nor Michael, um, both of them raised the heat in the situation by saying, uh, if you don't do it my way, essentially, um, I'm out of here. Uh, I don't need to, to, keeping me in this role is not worth uh, standing still. Um, and the idea of raising the heat in the system when you're trying to get a community that has not has avoided dealing with a difficult issue to face that issue, you almost always have to raise the heat in the system a bit. You have to put some pressure in the system so people start to pay attention to something that they would obviously have preferred not to pay attention to. Um, the, the second idea that I wanted to put out there before we transition to the small groups um, is that a crisis is an opportunity. Uh, I've been working with a lot of nonprofit people in the Jewish world and outside of the Jewish world over the last year and trying to help see the, the incredible stress that uh, the COVID has put people under, to see it as an opportunity to move forward on some ideas, some projects, uh, some reforms uh, that have been around for a while, but there has been no... Uh, no external force which opened people up to possibilities that they hadn't seen before. So trying to think of a, a crisis, not just COVID, but the next crisis that you're going to happen, a financial crisis or a service crisis or a, 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 a footprint crisis, whatever the kind of crisis is that you're dealing with, to see it as an opportunity to make some progress rather than to see it as a problem that has to be fixed. One of the things that is shared in both Michael and Brian's story is that they saw the, uh, their role as not um, trying to predict the future, but trying to invent the future uh, to take responsibility for that. So Gabe, are we ready to move into small groups? We are indeed, when you're ready. Okay, let me, let me before we uh, go through that process of dividing people up to small groups, let me suggest that we're we're gonna give people something in the 15 to 20 minutes range. And what our goal is, is that each, each of you in your small group will have a chance to 
frame uh, your current leadership challenge as you understand it and get some feedback and some questions from your colleagues. And then maybe some uh, ways of thinking about it that uh, might be new to you with some fresh eyes and fresh ears. Um, so let's begin that process. All right, we are back. Uh, as usual, probably, probably too short a time. Uh, we've dedicated the remainder of this session to a time for uh, reactions to the earlier conversations, reaction to discussion in this room, questions of each other, questions of Marty. Uh, um, and Marty, I'll turn to you to see uh, if you have any comments before we ask folks to raise their hand and, and for those comments and questions. No, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, curious for the questions. Great. So reactions to the discussions just now, questions of Marty. Um, How about a question for Brian? Um, I'm reading, Brian, I read, I read what you sent along and I appreciate that, that's great. Um, and I've been to your center, so I, and I think it's, it's huge and it's, it's a great center. What are you doing with that space for fitness? Um, are you worried about losing that $2 million in membership from your health club members? Uh, how are you making that up? What does that strategic plan look like going forward? So I'm sure. just curious. Well, um, you know, we made a strategic decision uh, that we could uh, focus on what we saw as our future mission of building community through world-class programming and not only doing, performing it, but being a collaborative engine for it. So we modeled our new um, uh, center on not needing that revenue. So um, part of that, analysis is that we needed to be able to give that space back to the owner of the building, the landlord, which was the foundation. So as you can imagine, that has been a very interesting conversation, getting them to essentially agree to take the space back and um, demolish it. So the, our community, over a long period of time, we convinced them to, uh, to reduce our footprint and demolish it and create a new viable, more agile, small center. But it, it, it does affect our budget, but we had had a declining membership. So we had, we had been already well along the process of not being reliant on the contribution of the health club. But without getting rid of that real estate, it wouldn't work at all. I don't know if that answered your question at all, Scott. I hope so. Well, yeah, I, you know, the, the, the per, thing that perplexed me is a lot of us, at least for me, I, I'm, I'm always wanting to reinvest in fitness because that's one of our major things that brings membership to the table. So I'm there throwing dollars into that and, and we're seeing the payoff and you went the other way. So I'm yeah. interested to see how a J will function without a major, yeah. you know, 65% of our members come from for fitness. So yeah, I just want to, I want to make it clear, as I've said to my uh, friends and peers in this, that. The story that led us to this conclusion is not the story that pertains to most towns. So I by no means sit here and say this is the right decision for someone else. The crisis in Detroit before the pandemic and then the pandemic um, and looking into what I think is the golden era for JCCs in this arena of building community through programming and the technology and the platforms that can augment that and hybrid programming, I can't tell you how unencumbered, I feel, in Detroit of being able to move into that paradigm. But that, that is easier for us because we get a very large allocation and we can live without it. Anyway, right, that, Scott, Scott, could I just make an observation about that also? That um, is part of a more general observation, which is a question to everyone about uh, mm -hmm. what you learned during the COVID process and how you can take forward what you learned um, and leave behind what you never want to have to experience again. Um, and to be as systematic about that as possible. Saying that, uh, one of the realities, and I'm saying this without knowing any individual situations at all, one of the realities is that uh, uh, my assumption is for most, in most JCCs that are, uh, have a robust uh, health club facility, that facility has been closed and people have found other ways to get the exercise they need and what kind of an opportunity that presents to rethink, not to eliminate necessarily, but to rethink the function of the health club, its role in the JCC and its role in the community. 
just because people have now had that experience, um, is an example of trying to see the, the COVID-19 experience as an opportunity to think about priorities and values and what's most important. Thanks, Scott. We're gonna move to Peter. Yeah, it, it, my, my comment is much on the same uh, on the same vein as what we're discussing. And I think that what what our role is, is that we need to prepare ourselves for the reality that what we're seeing, <clears throat> which is a staggered and less than optimal return, is going to continue and that we're going to continue to see a lot of, quote unquote, empty treadmills in our fitness center or far fewer people through our doors and that we're going to see an emotional letdown of our staff and, and our board members who are going to struggle with the slow return. And, you know, the leading indicators right now are showing a longer period of disruption than we want. And I believe very strongly that these indicators are not, are not merely leading indica indicators of a period of disruption, but rather leading indicators of a permanent disruption. And, and I like, you know, Brian's challenge of you know, seeing ourselves as a platform uh, for building Jewish community uh, rather than a physical place. And, and I think, you know, somebody who's done an excellent job with the positioning of the language of that uh, is Mark Shapiro in, in talking about places and spaces. And so where I'm, where I'm struggling most right now is in getting our board to recognize that this is a permanent disruption and not a period of disruption. They seem to be willing to use hope as a strategy and they just continue to hope that people are gonna return. Um, and, and I just believe that especially for our fitness business, uh, which is the slowest to rebound, uh, that Brian's you know, building a model that isn't dependent upon that um, is likely uh, would behoove us all. You know, For many years, we've been talking about uh, uh, how fitness fits into the JCC model uh, Alan Finkelstein's challenges years ago to, you know, to think about membership in a different way, uh, you know, certainly are, are reemerging. And, and, you know, COVID has been the accelerant on the fire uh, for everything that existed before. Uh, so it's just, it's just burning that fitness business a little bit, uh, a little bit more intensely uh, than we were seeing in the years previous. Mm -hmm. Mark, can, can you can you get your your or Peter, can you can you get your board to uh, think about it as a contingency rather than have you be the uh, deliverer of bad news? Yeah, that's our challenge right now, and and a lot of it is related to the inability, I believe, to the inability to meet in person. Uh, the Zoom fatigue and the distraction that we all see. Um, is, uh, is, is powerful. Uh, we're just not able to have the type of true conversations that, um, that we were previous. And um, can, can you think of other ways that you could get their attention, um, maybe using the Detroit example or other examples that, because uh, I think you're, you're the problem is real. You know, you've got a constituency that doesn't want to face um, what seems to be a possible, if not likely, reality. And thinking about how you get them to do that when they would prefer not to is that's a leadership challenge. Yeah, yeah, and 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 exacerbating that real that uh, that challenge is the fact that the federal government just continues to shower money upon us, right? Which I'm taking every penny. Uh, everything they want to give. And so, you know, between the market run up and the, uh, and the federal money, uh, we are quite literally, you know, millions and millions of dollars in a positive cash position than we were going into COVID. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, that's a challenge, right? Uh, it's not say one you can't overcome, uh, nor is it necessarily a bad challenge, uh, but a challenge nonetheless. But I suggest the possibility for people who still have very successful health clubs, if they believe that any of these larger uh, ideas apply to them, is you know uh, what we had thought is that we wanted to reduce our reliance on that. We want to stop do start stop chasing the building as much, and frankly, doing things like Mark Sokol did, which was his platform, and I don't want to speak for him, his families 
we see our platform uh, as this, what we're working on this J Live project, project, which is to be a platform for the whole community's programming, not just our own. Um, so, you know, there are ways to uh, be both, uh, you know, staying with your health club because it's serving you, but also looking towards the future and how you can become way, I mean, not that you aren't already, but becoming even more preeminent as this platform for program. That's an idea. Um, thank you, Peter. We're going to move to Mark. Mark Sokol. Yeah, thank you, Leah. Just, I just wanted to say, having spent a, a lot of time uh, talking with Brian over the last uh, low, these ma low these many months uh, about where he's going, I, I think the, what he's done, ha and I'm just not as familiar as Michael with your story, with, with the story that you told earlier, but um, the, Brian has an awful lot to teach without it being how we replicate exactly what he did around health and fitness. There, there's a process thing here that, that, that Brian went through, and I think it sounds an awful lot like, Michael, you went through it as well, was Brian decided where he was going to bet the farm on the, on the future, who his allies were, when he was going to go to the barricades, what he needed to do that, you know, kind of what his, what his breaking points, uh, what his breaking points were. Um, and I just, I, I don't think we should get stuck on his answer. We all have common problems, but I, I think our solutions and our answers may tend to be more hyper-local than we, than we think. But I think we have a, an awful lot to learn from Brian's process here as how he went through it, because we're all to some extent on some, you know, on some scale in similar situations, deciding, like Marty said, how we're going to take, you know, this, this crisis as, as opportunity. Again, just as a limited example, in the last crisis, in the recession, we decided to bet the farm of this JCC on a, on a new family engagement model built around Jewish family engagement and, the, and, and PJ Library. And we've been dealing with the results for the last 12 years. It was one answer that worked for us based on who we were and what our local conditions are. And, and similarly for Brian. So I don't think there's one answer, but I think there's a, uh, I was going to say a shitload. I won't say a shitload. There's a shitload to learn from Brian's process and the criteria about making the decision, what the partnerships look like, the strength of the board, the lead, you know, all, all the, the stuff that Mar I think that Marty was talking about earlier. We have, uh, Brian has an awful lot to teach in this situation about the process, not necessarily about the, about the answers. Yeah. Michael's point about uh, looking for easy early wins as a way of uh, building support for the bigger picture, I think this is worth underscoring again. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we're going to take one last question. Marshall, do you still have a question? Yeah, more of a, just asking Michael and Brian to reflect a bit. Um, when you were creating the buy-in um, and there was excitement and you're, I'm, I guess I'm projecting, one, did your board, um, board's willingness to act swiftly um, and boldly accelerate and have you seen um, since you've, you know, one the pandemic, but two, you've had um, traction. Has has it has you, have you either seen a slowdown um, or wanting to sort of go back to, you know, discussions and process instead of just making decisions and building on that success? And if so, um, how are you working through that? And is there sort of uh, maintenance other than spending a tremendous amount of time and energy in you know bringing everybody along for the ride with with phone calls and emails um, that, that you found to be effective in maintaining you know that that uh that momentum michael they've heard too much from me go ahead unmute yourself michael Sorry. Um, so I don't, what, what was unique, maybe a little, maybe a little bit, but probably similar to what a lot of people experience is that a, a portion of our board, I wouldn't say a majority, but a significant portion of our board was not, was not supportive of this. Um, and, and so we spent a huge amount of effort, years of effort, uh, having a very uh, unbiased approach to every piece of this of the of the discovery process the due diligence uh, process 
we went on for for literally two years. Um, and and still, even at the end, there were board members who were just opposed to it, never could never could look at it, never could see it, what didn't want to talk about it, and voted against doing it. And so um, there was some damage done, I think, to some relationships because of that, because there was a percentage of people who thought that it was like the Michael Waldman project, and, and it was some, for some reason to advance my life in some way, even, even though I said multiple times, you know, it would be way easier not for me to not do this. But that, that was sort of irrelevant. The, the, the nice thing, though, now we had this opportunity. We have a brand new board. Everyone on our board is new to the Minnesota JCC. We have a smaller board and mostly all new people. So we've had this opportunity to kind of reset what the conversation is, how process works, what board meetings look like, and everything. So it's been really, for me, like a huge relief almost since January 1st. Uh, it, it, things have gotten way easier. It's hard because for the staff, it's gotten much harder since January 1st. But for me personally, it's actually gotten in some ways much easier, believe it or not. Great, thank you, Marshall. So Marty, we'll leave you for uh, with some final thoughts. Thank you, Leah. And uh, thank you all for your participating and engagement. Uh, I'm curious about uh, whether this, what you got out of the small group experience, and I hope you'll provide some feedback to Leah and Gabe um, so the experience can be shared more broadly. Um, I want to underscore one thing that uh, from the last couple of minutes of conversation, and that is that uh, one of the uh, inevitabilities of leading deep change, and we've had several examples of that so far, um, is that there are going to be casualties. Uh, you know, whenever ever anybody tells me this is going to be a win-win, uh, then uh, I know nothing really important is going to happen. Um, because the resistance to change, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a, a piece of mythology that says people resist change. I don't believe that's true. Uh, nobody resists change when they think it's going to be good for them. Uh, nobody gives away a winning lottery ticket. Uh, most of us on this call are probably married and have children and, uh, you know, those are big changes. Uh, we've all made changes in our lives when we thought they were going to be good. What people resist is loss. And the resistance that uh, hmm. Michael experienced, that uh, uh, Brian experienced, that they've talked about, uh, is, com is, is comes from people who initially felt that their fabulous ideas uh, weren't so good for them, uh, that they were going to threaten something that uh, um, even though on paper in a technical sense, it didn't seem to be working for them, it was working. We all, we all stay in, uh, in uh, uncomfortable relationships long after we knew they were uncomfortable because they seem to be working for us. Uh, um, you know, we, we don't, uh, we don't think there's anything like a, there's, there's no such thing as a dysfunctional organization or a dysfunctional family or a dysfunctional system because every organization, every family, every system is perfectly organized to get the result that it's currently getting. And that's why the status quo has so much momentum behind it because people have figured a way to make it work for them. And that that's, easier for lots of people than transitioning to something that they don't know is going to be as successful. Uh, I wanted to close. Uh, uh, I hope this uh, time has been useful for you. It's been interesting for me to hear some of these stories. Um, I wanted to close making two points, underscoring two points. Uh, uh, the first is to try to be as intentional uh, as you can about what you uh, learned from the experience of going through COVID uh, and of all the adaptations that you made, all the changes that you had, you made that you had to make to accommodate to the, the really disruptive reality that we all experienced in one way or the other, which of those changes actually are useful to bring forward? Uh, and to try to be ex as explicit and uh, conscious and intentional about those would be really useful. Um, by the same token, which of those adaptations that you made are, um, 
uh, do you wish to leave behind? But trying to be trying to be conscious and explicit about that, I think, is a is a way of taking advantage of the opportunity, that the challenges we have. Um, the last point, and this is a kind of um, uh, a complicated point, I think, to leave you with. Uh, but I think uh, the stress that you have been working under the last 15 months has take, must have taken an enormous toll on people. Um, every one of us has been on a different kind of journey, but for each one of us, it's uh, been something we haven't uh, asked for. And what that suggests to me is that going forward, one of the lessons of this experience is that if you're in a senior role in an organization, dealing with all the challenges that this disruptive environment has presented to you. Um, you. You need to come out of that taking responsibility for taking care of yourself. Uh, to realize that organizations will suck up as much of your time and energy as you offer to them. And sacrificing your body for the cause doesn't do you any good and doesn't do the organization any good. Um, so making a commitment coming out of this experience to take responsibility for making sure that you're getting the, the kind of um, time away, uh, the kind of rest, uh, the decent night's sleep, and you're eating right, and you're having the kind of relationships outside of your professional life that make you feel like a whole person, um, those responsibilities really uh, come back to you. Uh, and not to expect that other people will provide them for them. You need to bring your A game to this role and uh, you can't bring your A game if you're not taking care of yourself. Um, so on that note, I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to spend some time with you. Uh, um, uh, back in my time in Boston, I was a JCC member and uh, uh, you are, you're doing really important, important work, uh, but it's evolving work. And to be there at this time, as you begin to create the future of the JCCs, which as several people have pointed out, is going to be distinctive in distinctive communities. It's going to be different for everyone. Uh, it's a great, great, great opportunity. So thanks and have a wonderful day and the rest of the conference. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Marty. And I also um, want to take this opportunity to Thank this very, very special panel. Um, on behalf of um, Gabe and myself, um, I want to thank you, Marty and, um, and Brian and Michael, for sharing your very honest thoughts and experiences. Um, this is not something we take light. And I also want to thank this very esteemed group of JCC leaders uh, who shared your thoughts and your wisdom with all of us here today. So thank, thank you. Leo. Um, pleasure. You know, uh, Marty, you just mentioned, you said that change is good. Um, and, you know, all the possibilities around change is sitting here, personally from Israel, but um, seeing all of our GCC execs, and, you know, you mentioned the stress, the enormous stress that they've all been through. Seeing the stress, but at the same time, as enormous as the stress is, the enormous, the outcomes, the silver linings, the programs, the way that the all GCC execs were able to keep their GCCs together and add more programs and more possibilities to grow and expand. Uh, personally, I, I think that that's admirable and I just wanna commend you all and thank you. And again, thank you, Marty, for your wisdom and thoughts and uh, Michael and Brian for sharing your uh, experiences. And thank now, you, Michael, Brian, um, and Leo. Bye -bye. Enough for some general pro con notes and housekeeping. So uh, from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern today, we hope many of you will join us for our GCC Excellence Showcase. Um, and we really encourage you to join us in this very diverse 30 minute sessions uh, to learn from colleagues in the GCC field about how to replicate and or collaborate successfully on excellent programs and initiatives at your GCCs. These dynamic sessions will showcase excellence in programs, attracting and retaining best staff, visionary management, marketing methods, and more. And if you want more information on that, that's on the conference website. 
From 5.15 to 5.45 Eastern today, you're invited to connect with GCC fellows uh, across the continent through J Cafe. Imagine that you are uh, sitting at a hotel and meeting everyone at the lobby or by the bar. So this J Cafe um, is our virtual coffee lounge. And um, it's the place for low pressure, casual conversations among GCC professionals, uh, beyond our peer community and through the peer community. And it's just a great place to recap uh, your day and bond with someone new. So please join. And uh, this is a new platform for many of you. Um, the platform is called uh, Kumo Space. And if you haven't used it before, you may want to join to see how it works because we feel, we believe that it's a wonderful uh, virtual way to have informal conversations uh, that you can make try to your communities. Finally, I want to remind that the ProCon virtual vendor hall will be open again tomorrow from 1.45 through 2.45 Eastern. And sponsor representatives, including uh, Acrosoft corporations and collaborative strategies will be available for live video sessions and chats. And we hope that you all visit them. So with that, our gratitude again to Marty, Michael, and Brian, and to all of you and to our sponsors. Uh, thank you all for joining us, for being with us here tonight. It was great seeing all of you. Too bad that it's through Zoom. Mishanaba in person by the bar uh, somewhere nice uh, in the United States or Canada and enjoy the rest of the conference. Goodbye and uh, shalom. Thank you. Oh.